as we combat this terrible pandemic where the entire world is in chaos, especially India, which is gasping desperately for air. We are facing huge and complex challenges, one of which is our food ecosystem. Malnutrition, poor diets, unsafe food, food loss, and food waste are some of these challenges. These challenges existed even before the pandemic, but now they are only exacerbated by the current situation. There is an acute need to bring about a food systems transformation, and there's a role to be played by each one of us. Today's book is particularly relevant to this discussion. The book that we are focusing on is entitled Vegetarian Cuisine from the Himalayan Foothills, Flavors and Beyond. And it is the beyond that we are truly interested in. I'm delighted to introduce the panel, Veena Sharma, who is an academic and the author of this book, renowned historian and food critic, Dr. Pushpesh Pant, and celebrity chef, Gautam Meherishi. Welcome all to the program. And uh, to all of you who are tuned in today, uh, a warm welcome and greetings to you all. And we do hope that you will post your questions and comments in the comments box, and then we'll take them either towards the end of the program and sometimes even in the middle during the discussion. But to kick off the discussion, first question to you, Veena Ji. It was an amazing journey of discovery of herbs and vegetables and grains that one hadn't even heard of before uh, when one read the book. But how would you describe your book and what, what led you to um, write this book? Yes. Yes, Jasleen, as you said, this is a very critical juncture when our land is ravaged by this pandemic. And I think every one of us has been touched in one way or another by this pandemic. So let us wish everyone well to begin with. And uh, uh, Absolutely. It, is not, it is not an inopportune moment to discuss food. Because as you said, food is central to our being, food is central to our immunity, it is central to our personality, to our society, it is central to our environment. So, um, yeah, I think it's a good moment to discuss food, even though we are in the midst of a pandemic. So I've been visiting Rishikesh for a long, long time. Since the year 1980, I've been a visitor. And every time I took the drive from Haridwar to Rishikesh, I would see these terraced hills along the mountain sides. And uh, the hills would, these terraced um, farms would somehow send a, a wave of joy through my being. It was as though, um, as though it was they, they, they stood, they bore a testimony, so to say, of uh, a relationship between man and nature, a symbiotic mm -hmm. relationship between man and nature. But uh, subsequently, of course, things have changed drastically, tremendously. And it was in the, uh, about five years ago that I moved here. And when I did move here, I would go to the Mandi, I would visit the Mandi, and I was really, really amazed with the plethora of produce that they overflowed with. Things, as you said, which I had never, I myself had never seen before. And they were, they were all kinds of greens, like many kinds of poi. There was a, a circular kind of coiled up sag called lingada. There were many kinds of cholai. There was batwa. There was different types of rye, soy, sarso, and pahari palak, and among other greens, there was another vegetable called kakora, which in its which looked like a light green coronavirus, but <laughs> it has a lot of very sweet benefits with it, which we are hoping that the virus is also going to bring eventually a lot of benefits in terms of in terms of, um, you might say, um, 
awareness, hopefully that will happen. And then there were so many herbs like Jakya, the ubiquitous Jakya is Faran and, um, and uh, Chora, many of which come from the upper regions of the Himalayas. Yeah. And there is Bhangjira, which has nothing to do either with Bhang or with Jira. And there are different types of millets, which I love. Millets like um, Jangora and Mandua, which, is, which has been a staple around here, but it somehow is now going out of use. Then there are legumes like Pulat, Tor, Pahari Urad. There are Navrangi Dal, where just on one, one plant, uh, many colored little, little beans grow. So it's a beautiful, small little thing. And they also call it uh, Nepali dal for some reason. I don't know why. And then I have never seen so many kinds of rajmas. They are black and red and cream and white and uh, variegated. They are flat and round and small and big. You have any number of varieties that are available all together. So really, for the first time, uh, the meaning of biodiversity came clear to me in a very palpable fashion. All those um, terraced hills at their various heights facing different directions, they uh, get uh, different amounts of sunlight, or they, they get different types of wind velocities or different types of rainfalls. So every little farm produces some different uh, grain or a pseudo grain or a pulse or, or a different produce. And then you know, the picture of, that you're building for us is, uh, is so beautiful and so idyllic. Um, and yet, uh, you know, I would move uh, my next question to um, Dr. Pan. You know, uh, of course, we see the beauty of the mountains, but you know, to 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 see these details of these wonderful herbs and wonderful vegetables that uh, Rishikesh has bought a few hours from here, but we not see most of them even in Delhi or anywhere else in the place. Compliment the author. This is a book which is written from the heart. This is a book Absolutely. Which is written, from, written from the heart. And when Dr. Veena Sharma talks of the terrace fields in the mountains, she evokes nostalgic images which bring, take me back to my childhood. Born in Uttarakhand, brought up in Uttarakhand, came down to the plains as refugees only at the age of 18, 19. So I think you can take a man out of the mountains, but you can't take the mountains out of the man. I think in, her, well case, in her case, the journey is brilliant. She fell in love with mountains and decided to settle down there. I think she has done a great job and I think Yogis, the publishers, need to be complimented. They have been, the book has been published, produced very well. Pictures are absolutely tantalizing. I wish we could share some of the pictures in the course of the discussion. You have a book with you, a hard copy. I have right only, had, only had a PDF, so maybe you can share some of the beautiful pictures. I enjoyed the book thoroughly. I think her concerns, the author's concerns, are very, very topical. You talk in terms of food being central to our existence. It yes. takes us to immunity, it takes us to biodiversity, mm -hmm. and so on. The only thing which had me a little confused was that the title says food from Himalayan foothills and beyond. And sometimes the beyond takes us beyond the foothills. There is a recipe from Jharkhand, which I love greatly because the philosophy of food, which is foraged foods in Jharkhand, is almost the same as the forest dwelling upper reaches of the Himalaya was Himalayan foothills. Now, uh -huh. I am quite fond of Rishikesh myself, but there mm -hmm. were some concerns which I thought I would like to ask the author because she has done so much hard work on this book. There are certain recipes which, to me, appear a bit jarring, keeping in mind the philosophy which she has outlined, what she has focused on, the primacy of food, like something like a four gulab jamun or something like mm -hmm. a almost malpua. Now, I think, you know, that is the kind of a thing which... Uh, strikes to my mind a little jarring note in an absolutely brilliant book you know i think it could have, those recipes could have been avoided perhaps uh, because they are not the recipe they almost take you into the realm of the iskon cookbook 
which is directed towards the groupies who go to the temple, must be given a pudding, must be given a hamburger, <laughs> must be given a biscuit in a prasad. So I don't know anywhere in the Himalayas, either in the foothills or in the above the alpine zone, where they have any necessity to have a four malpua or a four gulab jamun. So, you know, the, those are the recipes which probably could have been done without. And okay. also there's a gajar ka halwa. But, you know, unless you can have a new take on a gajar ka halwa or something like that, I think the, you know, the focus shifts a little from biodiversity, millets and grains. I, I enjoyed the book. These are minor niggles. These are minor yeah. niggles of a parochial pahadi, if I may say so. But uh, <laughs> uh, because if you, if you take the Himalayan foothills, the thin strip of belt takes you from Himanchal to Uttarakhand, Garhwal, Kubau, to Western Nepal. It goes on and on towards uh, all the way to Meghalaya, to Darjeeling, West Bengal, Kanchenjunga zone. So one was expecting that some of that would be there also. There were some translations which had me totally flummoxed. There is some reference to a beef steak plant. Now, the beef steak plant sort of, uh, under the present circumstances, seems pretty jarring when beef is illegal to eat and can land you in prison for 10 years, if not more. You can be lynched. But all in all, I greatly enjoyed the book. I absolutely am delighted that somebody has done this. And I, I, I think it deserves to be read and reread and used in real life. So, so that's a picture of what you're talking about. Can you see it? I missed uh, Professor Punk a little bit. And also, I want to say that for the pictures and the photographs, it is really uh, Nandita Singh, the photographer, who should be credited. And also, as you said, the, the, the team of the publishing house who worked I very dedicatedly. I, I, I'm, I'm sure Nandita Singh has been given credit in the book. But a great photograph can be ruined unless it is processed well, it is printed That's well. It is scanned well. And I yes. think the, what I looked at the uh, PDF copy, absolutely brilliant photographs, absolutely yes. brilliantly displayed. That is why I said the team, the, the publishing team. But at the same time, Professor Pant, I missed a bit of you, what you said. But I would also like to say that the mountains, particularly this area of the mountains, is Devabhumi, the land of the gods, and particularly this part of the Himalayas. And the streams that come down from the upper regions, they bring so many minerals and herbs. So they feed this, the, the produce uh, in such Dr. a way. Dr. 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 Sharma, that is something which is a debatable point. The moment you call Himalayas the Dev Bhumi, you enter into the realm of religion and you enter into a realm of mythology and where science may not necessarily validate all the claims. Ganga, the holy river, the water is not fit even. 50 Absolutely. kilometers down from the source to take this, a bath or wash, forget about drinking. So if the rivers have been polluted, the sanctified land there, Bhumi has been turned into a land of yes, natural calamities that is and, the tragic part. Yes. and And then we cannot have it both. You know, we can't have the cake and eat it at the same time and say, this is Dev Bhumi, this is sanctified by Ayurveda. And also it is biodiversity. I mean, I would much rather keep the gods out of it. I would say yes. that uh, there's an old English poem. I'm sure you are aware of that. Uh, great things happen when men and mountain meet. Uh, yes. And yes. If we keep in the man mountain interaction and yeah. keep in mind people like uh, Bar I, who have done. Yeah. I would just like to say that a lot of minerals and herbs come in these streams which feed them. And because yeah. I've always been interested in the therapeutic value of food. So that is what attracted me very much. And as you can see, this is really, as uh, uh, as Gautamji would see, it's not really a chef's book. It's really a cookbook that we uh, take stuff and it's just exploration and experimentation and also seeing the various ramifications of food in our lives. And uh, so... In fact, uh, in fact, uh, in fact Binaji, somewhere you've mentioned in your introduction that it was always about a little bit of this and a little bit of that. These are not precise yes. recipes, but, uh, you know, there was this entire uh, zero waste uh, policy that you followed, uh, yes. not because you were trying to be an ecologist or anything, but that's who you are. So therefore, yes. it becomes almost like a personal meditation that you, you take Absolutely. ingredients that, uh, that inspire you and you take ingredients which are available in the kitchen on that particular day and you and say, what can we do? Simple 
There's no, no extraordinary, no fancy ingredient in it. Recipes are simple, easy to make, which we can put out on our tables every day. Yeah. And so, uh, of course, a lot of stuff is available on, on the net these days. But yeah. there's something to say for having a number of different kinds of recipes in a small book. Yeah. Uh, which you can handle and which you can have in front of you. So so I think the way this should be described, and this is what Gautam uh, Maharishi would agree with, is, you know, when you're talking about vegetarian cuisine for the Himalayan uh, foothills, you, you're not talking about a cuisine. It's almost like a personal letter from the Himalayan foothills to the people. It's your personal journey. This is what you see. So you're not describing necessarily traditional food that that, uh, that are eaten by the Pahadis, these are the foods that you absorbed and picked. And therefore, there are some very unusual uh, combinations. Gautam, you would have come across things like uh, uh, sweet potato uh, along with, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, zucchini. Zucchini. Zucchini yeah. and sweet potato. That, that, that seems to be straight out of what you would be serving in one of your fancy uh, restaurants, no Gautam? <laughs> So, you know, uh, what I like about the book, uh, really, really congratulations, Veena Ji. The way you have progressed the recipes in the book. You know, otherwise, uh, in normal standard cookbooks, you would find ingredients, method, some pointers, some calorie values, there's that, yeah. and a small introduction. But, you know, this really progresses the recipe step by step, where, where the ingredient is important, how the ingredient is important, and why it is to be put at a certain stage, you know, it really signifies. And as a, as a chef, when I read this book, it actually tells me uh, what my grandmother used to teach me, you know, when I was yeah. a kid. She, she, she never used to let me in the kitchen without having a bath, without being satanically clean. So this is what happens when you when you read or go through a book like this, you have to be satanically clean, cleansed from yeah. inside, you know, to yeah. understand the book, to understand the flora and to understand the, the growth, the grains, the, the seasons the vegetation, the pulses and everything. You know, in 1000 BC, uh, uh, I'm talking about 1000 BC. Hmm. This is when two grains, pearl, uh, barley and millet, these, these were the two grains that everybody knew. But as the agrarian uh, civilization grew and uh, they realized the importance of cattle and uh, the, the flock not being butchered for meat, but hmm. it, it, it was expensive to, you know, uh, uh, raise them and to keep them and then just to cut them and eat them. But they actually realized the importance of these things. And this is how civilization actually progressed. This was the beginning of the importance of vegetarianism into our world. So I think uh, what this book actually beaut beautifully describes is the fact that uh, it's, it, as, a, as a kid, I've been to many hotels of India, you know, uh, be it Leh, Ladakh, the Himalayas, where, it, where everything is very scarce to Assam, Mizoram, and to Mekhalia, and uh, of course, Rishikesh, Dehradun, and all those parts. What I've seen is, you know, the, they really value the growth, what grows in their farmlands, what grows in the, uh, we call it terrace farming. When we call it Assam, when we say Assam, we only think of tea, but it's not actually tea. They grow leaves, they grow grain, they grow pulses, they grow food, the hemel is different. So many things are different from what we actually know. So the book actually also breaks a lot of myths. It also tells people, you know, that, okay, uh, this could be a Garwali uh, inspired cooking, but it's also uh, inspired from a person or from uh, somebody's perspective from childhood till day uh, who has seen the foothill uh, being blessed with so many details into the nature. Uh, I will also like to point out a few things, you know, that uh, probably which as a chef, I did not really impress me. So, Vinoji, please uh, do take this as positive uh, criticism, maybe because uh, <laughs> it's such a beautiful book. I didn't want to mention anything, but you know, uh, there are several uses of drumstick, coconuts, and uh, in a couple of recipes, usage of paneer, which I think uh, brings out the, the holistic uh, approach of a home chef or something coming from uh, a home kitchen or a home-based kitchen. But I think a little more uh, little more thought, a little more idea on the, on those aspects, if you had the detailed out, this, would have, this book would have become actually 102%. Uh, this is 100% right as of now. But th these are purely my thoughts because I'm a I'm a chef, and personally, I really I really uh, for me, if somebody asks me to cook something with paneer, I get dazzled because for me, paneer is not an ingredient to cook food with. Uh, that's mm -hmm. my personal opinion as a chef, you know. 
But yes, if somebody tells me, yeah, uh, cook food with finger millet, the, the, I'm going to show you the book because I luckily I have the book. So mm -hmm. I just pointed out, we uh, will uh, actually point out a few things. So if you see here, you know, uh, here, there, there is usage of finger millet. And this finger millet is being used in, in many forms. And surprisingly, you will see it being used in a uh, curry, a pearl millet being used in a curry, which is very, very unique. Of course, the mm -hmm. photography is fantastic. And, you know, in further down, there is something that I really, really loved, you know, and uh, detailing out ingredients, uh, which was like something like a bamboo shoot. It was absolutely beautiful. The way, yeah. I mean, yeah. personally, like this is my favorite recipe on the book, which is mm -hmm. a vegan brulee. It, it's a it's a myth which is broken by this book. I really like the way you know. So you've touched uh, Indian cuisine. You've touched uh, many parts of uh, India. You've touched uh, Western cuisine in a very different fashion, in a yeah. very different approach, in a very different way. You know, who would think of a vegan brulee? I mean, fantastic. Man. This is something which is uh, and uh, things like pumpkin pancakes, things like uh, different raitas. You know, the soup. All those things they are really path breaking for me. And uh, what I really like is also that, you know, in the middle or almost at the end of the book, you've included a lot of soups, which people tend yeah. to normally get in their books, you know. So it's, it's fabulous. But I'm just trying to find out where this uh, bamboo shoot was because this is Himalayan uh, bamboo shoot. It's really lovely to see. The, and uh, the way it is explained that it's different from the normal bamboo shoot, here it is. Otherwise, uh, it's in the circuit right there. Otherwise, people would just think, you know, bamboo shoot is from from a very tropical region. It's not actually yeah. grown in tropical regions only. It can grow anywhere. It's, it's a plant which grows, which only leads uh, water and uh, abundant sunshine, which is there on all foothills of India. So yeah, Vinaji, fabulous, fantastic. And uh, again, I would like to compliment you the way you have progressed the recipes in the book. Fantastic. And as for, thank you. As for bamboo shoot, it's, it's uh, very interesting. They, they took yeah. it from the forest. And in a way, yeah. we may call it, it's usually called growing wild or jungly. Yeah. But yes. anything that we don't cultivate, we call it wild. It's actually Correct. nature's gift to us. These yeah. are all nature's gifts to us, which mm -hmm. we don't recognize as that. And traditionally, uh, our uh, ancestors, they recognized that. They used it. But today, we are going into fashion foods. So the, the problem is that is what is creating the, the problem that uh, Pushpeshti was saying, all the pollution, etc., because of the fashions. So this book is really a lot about awareness, if you like, Jocelyn, you know. No, with, I, I agree with you. Uh, sorry to interrupt you on this, Minaji. I completely agree with you that this book is on awareness. But, you know, uh, our body, the human body has been saved for the last 25,000 years. There's nothing which has changed. We don't have four ears, we don't have four eyes and uh, two nostrils, uh, more than yeah. that. It's the same. We can change technology, we can bring in new things in technology, in fashion, in so many other things. Can we yeah. change the human body? No, we cannot change the human body. That's why the importance of the ingredients in this book. It's so, yeah. so beautifully uh, made up and, you know, assembled. And as you progress reading the book, the, the, the thing that will interest you is, you know, what else will you find on the next page? That's what the mystery to find about uh, ingredients, the usage of ingredients. I think that is just fabulous. So, uh, suddenly you will find a pizza popping up, you know, amazing. And, and you can actually imagine. <laughs> yes, and you, can, you cannot Ramana. imagine a pizza. Yeah, so because we are so intimidated by a, a word like a burger or a word like a pizza, somebody would call it pizza and then somebody would just connect, you know, call it pizza, you know. And uh, yeah. we call our own grains by different names and there's nobody to correct it. It's so... So that you know, our own growth, our own, uh, as you said, gifts of nature, we do not recognize. It's, it's high time that uh, such books come up, such books, uh, they reach people and they tell people the importance of legacy, the importance of uh, so many other things which the nature gives us abundantly. It does not even charge us money, you know. You can just yeah. go to the forest, <laughs> as you said, identify, you don't even need a, you don't even need a, uh, a board or a pig to identify where the trooper is hidden. This is hidden with your uh, acceptance. That's as simple as that. If we ask nature to give us one thing with heart, it gives us hundred things in abundance. That's what nature is all about. That's so that beautiful. brings us. Uh, uh, sorry, Vinaji. That brings us to this uh, important question, which uh, Vinaji has been raising about uh, the ecology. 
nature is giving us so much but what are we returning to mm. nature because we are now moving more towards packaging and um, yes. more 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 of the shine and the glitter mm. um, rather than the essence yes. which is food exactly so this is as we said that uh, even though we have remained the same but we have moved so far away from nature and we've so moved so far away from ourselves because yeah. it's uh, anomalous like we were talking just lean earlier also that uh, the things that are uh, closest and the most fundamental to us we are most unaware about them take yeah. for example breath we it is a life hangs on it from birth till the last moment but we are unaware of breath and mm -hmm. food is another item and we are totally unaware of ourselves and ourselves not in an esoteric or metaphysical sense but in the sense of very biological beings we don't realize that we've got this amazingly sophisticated factory inside us which is breaking down complex big foods into the subtlest and simplest of foods and we do not even think that we should help this process because we are told that there are trillions of microbes in in our gut that do this job and instead of helping them as you said we've gone in for fast foods refined foods packaged foods some things which come from far away which have no connection with our being in a particular place and time the result is that those microbes are not fed and the um, and after a good meal after a filling uh, i couldn't i shouldn't say good but a filling up meal there's still a sense of craving and then what we do is we put some more of the same kind of food those all big chunky foods uh, mm -hmm. fast foods big foods which do not supply the the micronutrients that the microbes are looking for which come from legumes from uh, mm -hmm. greens from uh, from uh, fibers we are not giving yeah. those at all so yeah. the result is restlessness and then we we find that there's a big connection between the mind and our gut and uh, the science of ayurveda and the practitioners of ayurveda tell us that there's a direct connection between the mind and the gut mm -hmm. and uh, and modern medicine is saying the same so this uh, pro the proverbial uh butterflies in the stomach is not uh, it's is not just words it's actually when we are anguished in the mind we feel it in the gut immediately because right. there is a direct connection so we Absolutely. can work the other way like gautam ji was saying we can work from the opposite side in order to make us less restless we can satisfy our gut and we can feed the microbes therein and maybe we will also impact our minds in that way and we will not have so much of that tinsel and garbage which comes with the packaging this online uh, the online foods the online shopping that has started so we have a lot more of packaging in it and yeah. a little bit of substance and all that packaging goes into our streams and mountains not only does it choke them up but it releases all its toxins therein and we get it back from the soils and the waters so we we are getting it back it's it's time that we learn our lesson yeah, yeah in fact um, in fact now people are um, yes got them i'll just finish this point people are also saying now that um, you know the corona virus is now in the waters for this very reason that uh, a lot lot of uh, what we are uh, putting in the rivers is coming back to us even in terms of the virus got up yes yeah, so i was you know i just remembered a theory called the 10th apple theory so there's a king okay. who goes to the forest and you know he, he he's running after a deer on his horse and suddenly gets lost inside the forest and he's lost he, he keeps looking for his way out and it's been 3 days that he's, he has no water he has no food nothing and then suddenly on the third day when it's about the sun is about to go down he finds an apple tree and he's really happy to look at the apple tree the ripened apples beautiful looking apples the, the shiny apples he goes there you know he plucks the first apple and he eats it and there is so much of gratitude in him he thanks the lord he thanks the skies he thanks his stars and he thanks everybody 
with his first bite and he, he he enjoys the apple by the time he's on the third apple he's, he's stopped enjoying the apple by the time he's on, he's on his fifth apple you know he's not even thinking about the apple and by the time he's on his eighth apple he bites the apple does not like throw it away and takes another apple and by the yeah. time he's on his 10th apple the last apple he is not even thanking anybody you know that's what happened to the world that we had so much in abundance we had so much at our uh, disposal that we stopped to be uh, uh, we stopped having gratitude towards things we stopped thanking nature we stopped thanking everybody and we stopped thanking uh, people around us for giving us whatever they are giving especially the farmers you know and uh, probably that's why i'm not negative about this pandemic at all but yes i, I see a positive that you know it's actually teaching people a lot of gratitude and it's high time we started giving a gratitude back to nature in our own way so that we don't reach this 10th apple we are always on the first apple and we always have this gratitude for everybody and for everything right from the guy who comes to clean our uh, uh, house from uh, the guy who who is uh, standing on the in, in the sun and telling us to go on right or left or uh, to the farmer to to everybody if we are not grateful and if we don't have, have gratitude this corona virus and other things are really small things which which are going to destroy the world you know one day and and, and uh, this is what is lacking this is what is leaking out and this is what is making the world not so better place that it was many years ago that's very beautifully put uh, gautam that really is the essence of what veena ji has been trying to say through this book and this is something we all have to understand and if you if you listen to um I, I you would have food science there's no difference between a potato and an apple except when you eat it with all your senses correct yes i'm so glad you bring up this point gautam because um if you remember traditionally whenever we sat in front of a plate of food in front of us a certain gratitude was offered yeah it was it was just a gratitude to nature and subconsciously unconsciously it connected us to a number of things as you said to nature to the fire in the kitchen to the one who is cooking and to our own bodies most importantly to settle down and eat not just pick up something which looks dazzling on the way and just eat anywhere if you're driving or you're walking or something and then throw the rubbish somewhere you sit down you respect food and that is what we have forgotten to do because we we are so distanced from nature we we right. don't we we get food from packages we don't right. buy food food from the mondays we do, nowadays in many places they've started having some farmers markets and all and those are very esoteric things yeah. as though yeah. they are very special but these are this is what we live with this is our background and yeah. this, then again our uh, we were told to eat with the seasons that which grew around us and not you know things that were transported from great distances for example we have these fashionable foods like quinoa or we have packages called ancient grains these same things coming to us quinoa i do not know where all it may be traveling from and we pay hundreds of rupees for it and you find ram dana which you just mentioned is much more at least a little more nutritious than quinoa and it is more tasty it's very you can do so many things with ramdana as you have noticed so i and think it's also more accessible very accessible and we're getting them from our own environment so from the season because nature gives us what we need at a particular time that is why we have so many different foods uh, people have forgotten seasons even they just yeah. buy anything out of season which is wrong for the system so we should remember our seasons and if you remember you know we have these uh, these transition times when often people fast during those times during spring or during sharad navratri etc and then they they just give themselves to very light foods because we are shifting from one kind of food to another from winter food into summer food and then in the sharad navratri we are shifting from summer food 
to winter food. So these are all, they have a reason behind them. But we have forgotten, we, we connect them with some kind of mythology or myth or something. That's not it. It's, That's it's, not it's, it. it's connected to our systems. Uh, Veena Ji, you know, this is actually quite the conundrum because um, I I'm also picking up now questions. We are getting a lot of questions from our viewers. Thank you for posting them. Uh, Atul Dev from Guru Pram, what an interesting introduction to the subject. Um, congratulations, Veena Ji, for... Uh, I'm looking forward to acquiring a copy of the book and locating the various vegetables mentioned. Um, Atreya Sharma from Bengaluru also uh, has asked a question. I'll take that later. Um, then uh, Pradeep Singh is, is saying, Veena Ji, is it possible to get the vegetables, herbs, etc. in and around Delhi and Noida? So, you know, this is where packaging comes in. So it becomes yes. a vicious circle. We can't all go to Rishikesh and to the mountains to get these uh, Yes, here. Yes. The, the kind of packaging we speak about is when it yes. is from great distances. After all, we are getting apples from Himachal in Delhi or yeah. from uh, different places. They're not traveling such great distances okay. and they remain seasonal. So we can continue to be seasonal. We, and th when they travel from, from let's say, from, from uh, Rishikesh area, from this region, yeah. from the Garhwal region or Kumau region, whatever, then they will not be traveling that great distances and they right. should not be packaged the way they, are, they have been done in such mm -hmm. fancy things. They should be just yeah. ordinary. Or we should we should be able to go to a pansari and get it. Just and get that, that is it. how we will be the mounds of of rubbish that we create will be phenomenally reduced. It is our responsibility to do that. As you started, you you said it so beautifully. Uh, Pushpeji, sitting in Delhi, missing the mountains. Where do you get your ingredients from? I do get them from the mountains. I think I agree with Binaji entirely. There is mm -hmm. a will. There is a way. If you want to okay. eat millet, when you go home or when somebody is coming from home, it is an overnight bus journey or an eight-hour drive. You get about 20 kilos of millets, which last you a long, long time. And, okay. and she has given a variety of grains. So the problem arises only for fresh vegetables. Dry right. vegetables are used in abundance in Himalayan region. You have herbs and uh, aromatics, which you use. Then she mentioned jakia. You could mention mm -hmm. jambu and so on. Even lingra and, you know, Satavari, like asparagus, could be used in pickled form, washed, shampooed, and used again as a vegetable. So I mm. think the problem is not there. The problem is there in our not being strong-willed enough to change our lifestyle. Two small points I would like to make, which to my mind have escaped our attention in this discussion. It is not uh. that men, men deliberately kick nature in the backside and want to alienate themselves from natural produce. There are right. those of us who have a choice to eat. We have a yeah. the metaphor has been used in this discussion. We have a plate in front of us. We feel grateful. We do graces and we thank mm. and relate to everybody. But there are millions of people, hundreds and millions in this country, who do not have a choice of what they eat. They eat right. what is given to them. Food is for them sustenance. Now the problem there is of aspirational foods. People mm. who traditionally ate foraged foods, ate local produce, ate millets, now think that these are coarse foods foods related with poverty and they should eat what the rulers see what the elites mm -hmm. see so you have mm -hmm. foods with additives food which is refined sugar refined salt and i'm so glad vinaji repeatedly says santa namak this is it you know so you mm -hmm. don't go to iodized salt or pink himalayan mm -hmm. salt so you, mm -hmm. all these things are not too difficult to get and i think the trouble is that once you get into urbanization once you get into the breakdown of the community from villages to uh, cities, right, you, right. You, you don't have too much of a choice. The second right. point which I wish to make emphatically is that the ancient verse says, Annam vai Brahma, Annam vai Rasa. It is equal info emphasis on the cosmological significance of the grains as right. it is on the enjoyment, the Ras part of it. The po po problem is the moment we mention the word Satvik, people think it is food given for sannyasis. Satvik right. is essential food, basic food, light okay. food. So that is what I think we have to devote our energies to. Uh, Binaji did mention the seasonal foods. So there are Shadritu and there are Shadrasas. So as mm -hmm. long as you can convince the people that A, it is affordable, it is not only for the privileged elite, it mm -hmm. is not a fashion or a vague, a vogue in vogue food, 
and then you go back to something variety of recipes which he has given which you can use and i don't think acquiring it in delhi or even bombay is very difficult you know no not not at all you know uh, gautam supposing we look at it the other way around instead of uh, you know if people like um, aspirational food if they like uh, prestige food as meena ji calls it uh what's wrong with making this food aspirational food and why why not include this as a part of fine dining i think there is not there is absolutely nothing wrong you know because it's not even an acquired taste it's up to the chef exactly. to really make that he that what he combines the food with and how he presents it uh, the only right. thing is to present it on a beautiful plate and the restaurant as you said and to describe it properly if you can stand up and describe with your chest 56 as a prime minister you know and telling people yes <laughs> this is what has come from the same soil on what you are sitting or for on the same soil for which your ancestors fought the same soil for which we sing our national anthem this is from there so bringing that pride into the food will i think will connect more people into this food you know so in this lockdown i've been watching a lot of uh, holocaust movies you know uh, mm. i mean the german mm. holocaust you know especially mm -hmm. in auschwitz The, the countries like Poland and especially yeah. cities like Warsaw, wha how and uh, the way they were deprived of food and water. If you see a, a movie called The Last Train to Auschwitz, you will realize the importance of water in our lives. And But today, absolutely. I remember, you know, a, as a kid, I never, used, I never saw a plastic bottle of water. It was always yeah. free, free flow. Go anywhere. If you're traveling somewhere, there were piaus. Go there, pay ten paisa, buy paisa, and, and there would be a lady sitting. Uh, with a surai and giving you thanda pani but today right. we have to buy this this is what we live for you know our our freedom our soul is depends on water 90% of our body's water is captured in this i mean that that is the sad part and that that's what i keep saying that you know if i tell people this is water from the stream people will not like it but if i tell them that this stream flows uh, seven states and this is this and this is that if i glorify it everybody would They no do this and start drinking that, but yes, to do that, everybody has to come up together. Everybody has to do it consistently, and everybody has to do it very creatively. You know, so mm -hmm. you know, if I'm in Mumbai, there's a there's a guy who's called Bulshi. So they do packaged waters, of course. It's, it's very nice packaged waters, but there would be many such streams where we where we can get fresh water from, fresh produce from within Maharashtra, within our right. state, reducing the carbon footage, reducing so many other things. and introducing uh, foods in a very fast well in a very uh, subtly uh, uh, fancier way I'm telling people right. yes this, as i said in the beginning this is where uh, shivaji maharaj fought for this is what he fought for please live up to it please respect that and start eating that do not be intimidated by the valleys of france and by the valleys of italy because somebody else fought for it not your grandfather or not your great grandfather Well, uh, well, yeah. one needn't take such an extreme step either. No? You can enjoy yeah. that and this, <laughs> and be proud of both. Uh, let's be inclusive. I think that should be uh, uh, probably the lesson of the day, isn't it? Yes. Uh, in this, uh, <laughs> if I may add that, in this inclusivity, we should right. not forget what Gautam was saying, because we uh, a few days back. a friend of mine from mumbai came here for a shoot and she right. went all over looking for uh, mandua ki roti and pulak ki dal and bhaam ki chutni she could not find it anywhere and whatever the dhabas were serving was maggi everyone wants <laughs> maggi yeah. and this is the fashionable thing and yeah. as you said that was poor man's food it is village food it is rustic food but those very things we are preparing in such beautiful ways and putting them on our urban tables and uh, uh, and also putting a whole lot of nourishment there uh, and we find that this makes such a big difference to uh, those who consume it because there are many people who when they eat food in a certain place they feel right. that they felt satisfied that right. means the whole of the system was satisfied there are certain things that are being given ye chala gaya is that are being given uh and uh, uh so uh they feel uh, they feel satiated 
But right. we uh, we forget that. We forget that, and we are giving all sorts of other different uh, materials into the system. So this satiation is an important thing, which comes from these grains, these so right. pseudo grains or seeds and herbs and uh, all kinds of other greens that we have. Doctor, so like if you if you go to a langar, for example, or anywhere, they, they use whole grain, whole foods, foods from the area, and then cooked lovingly. Of course, that ingredient also we shouldn't forget. Yes, that's, that's the most that's important the, one, isn't it? Certain amount of care that goes into the cooking of it. Uh, yeah. A chef would know that better than we know, but uh, that's the most important thing. When we put care into it. We can feel it uh, when we consume it. I think I think that's quite well put. Um, won't you agree, Doctor Pan, that the moment um, you know that's probably the difference between burnt food and experimental food is that there is a certain bhav to it. There is an excitement. I mean, whether it is love, at least it's positivity. No, well, you know, uh, just just kind of have a feeling that the bhav was always there in the food. When the mother right. cooked food for the child, the wife cooked food for the husband, or the husband yeah. cooked. Food, when the wife was sick for the family, in the hill villages, lots of it happened. Most males were reasonably good cooks. Also, uh, the problem is not that the bhav has not been missing. I think there is right. a dimension of the business of food, and the business of food is not only big business, processed foods, packaged foods, homogenizing taste. I mean, what uh, Veena ji was saying that she is mm -hmm. a standing example of this. That hundreds and thousands of pilgrims pass every year for the Chardam Yatra. Mm -hmm. Millions come for the home to Haridwar next door. They go to Hemkund Sahib. They go to the mini four dhams in the hills. And the problem is that there are lots of choti walas, dhoti walas, mucho walas, pooch walas. The hotels which serve you the dish of the worst variety. Ki saath mein khana hai, puri hai, sita bhaji ki sabzi hai, gobi ki sabzi hai, pyaaz nahi pada hai. It is a Jain thali or a Gujarati thali, and this puts a pressure. So this is at the grassroots level. The business of food. If the dhaba wala can serve for thirty rupees a plate of maggies, soaked up and spiced up and sexed up a little, he makes a profit of two hundred, three hundred percent on the packet. It is far more difficult for him to give healthy, nourishing food. Like the lady who comes looking, I remember in lots of hotels in Nainital and Rani Khetha Narmoda, they serve Uttarakhand thali. They have two madhwa rotis, they have jamuri ki khir, they have arvi ki sabzi, they have bhangira, they have ninguna. They have shishune ki sabzi, but that again is a stereotyped uh, thali being put, which a person might try try for novelty value once, but not try it the second time. I think where Veena ji's book makes a really significant contribution is that it allows you to play around with traditional ingredients, tickle your palate according the way you want to do it, and right. make it not only fast food but fun food enough for the children and family to eat. And coordinate with the seasons. So, 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 do you think, uh, Dr. Pan, that there is a um, a lack of awareness, perhaps, in some way, uh, where, say, the local dhaba? In, in fact, as as Veena ji was saying, uh, it's easier to get maggi uh, noodles at a dhaba than um, you know getting substantial local food. And when it is served, do you think it should be, uh, it should be branded in a particular way? Since we are talking about marketing, oh, 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 most certainly. I think the one that when Shiva tried doing it with Nodanya, others are doing it the organic food business. But they then they in turn become niche businesses themselves. They start yeah. catering to a particular clientele. No, I think right. that is not only lack of awareness. We are working at cross purposes. The government is launching very expensive advertising campaigns on fortified right. foods. From iodized yeah. salts to fortified oils with vitamin A and D, and promoting our particular food uh, as healthier food option uh, for the masses, then you right. suddenly discover this ultimately catering to a big business. So there is this awareness problem. The only person I we have deep respect for is somebody like Sunita Narayan, who in the Center yeah. for Science and Environment has brought out two brilliant cookbooks, uh, Food First and Primacy of Food, and then. Right. They, she, her authors concern themselves with the same uh, concerns as Veena ji's right. concerns: zero right. waste, back to nature, nourishing food, tasty food, eating according to season, and innovative with that. Veena ji, do you feel that there is also this um, 
uh, you know what Dr. Pant is saying is absolutely right. But do you think somewhere language is a big barrier? Because you know when we talk about all these foods now, uh, I, in fact, I have a comment from Tripta from Rishikesh who says, um, "I feel uh, now people are becoming aware of ancient healthy foods. Um, I got them from Amazon, but they are expensive. I wish they uh, they should reach the masses, and something needs to be done so that people are aware." So, do you also feel that you know it's the English speaking? Um, awareness lying only with a certain class of people and is you know it should be the awareness should um, be in the local language uh, <clears throat> definitely local languages matter but many many of these ingredients are available in different parts of india of right. course here they are they are there all together that is why the biodiversity aspect of it but there, yeah. there are many ingredients are there. I buy all my ingredients from the local pansari. I don't want to buy packaged foods which come. Uh, this is because, well, let me say that we haven't made enough exploration. We haven't made an effort. We haven't looked. And mm -hmm. so we can't complain that we don't get them because we do right. get them. If I can get them, this is what the whole book is about, that if I can do it, then anyone can do it because I'm an ordinary person. And even, <laughs> even the, uh, the uh, you know, in the recipes, the measurements, etc., are given for the sake of the cookbook. But right. once you have tried them a couple of times, you don't need to measure, etc. Just do your own thing and make your own combinations and concoctions and decoctions, however you like. So it's really not... Uh, no, I would not say that it's a language problem. It's a problem of uh, an elitist problem, probably, being mm -hmm. uh, not going down to the grassroots. We need to do that. And some. Uh, I, that's why I appreciate very much what Gautamji does. He goes into these grassroots and um, uh, creates uh, awareness as to what can be done with various things and how every part of a particular product can be used. So there's no wastage. And that is a very important part of home cooking because when we cook at home, for example, there is a sense of abundance. There's often enough to, to share with a neighbor or to share with a chance visitor that may come in. This has been our culture all along. So, and also uh, nothing really goes waste as yeah. such so absolutely think, yeah um so, before before i i go go to um you know a question to um gotham here you know it's a it's a lovely uh, mail that has come in from uh brazil uh sonia maria montero writes so funny i'm from brazil and i'm longing for indian healthy himalayan food this brings a reflection all over the world we have healthy ancestral food which can be explored I think that's quite an important point. Thank you much, uh, Gautam. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, people from Brazil who themselves have a lot of uh, fertile uh, produce are actually realizing right. the fact that uh, from the foothills of Himalaya spreading from from the top to I mean, uh, coming down to Garhwal, you have so much of produce that is related to health and especially to human health. If they can realize, I think, and I really don't like the word ancient, you know, because. We are, we are the people who are responsible for making these grains ancient. They never became ancient on their own. Uh, we are yeah. the ones who got intimidated by so many other things. We you know. And yeah. uh, we, travel, we travel from here to there and we keep uh, using flour, flour, and so much of flour that our uh, uh, grains. And as Vinaji directly pointed out, you know, in my journeys to these uh, smaller places, to these uh, interiors of uh, India, where I, where I tend to meet farmers and bring out these their difficulties in producing so many so many beautiful things. When I, learned, when I discovered sorghum for the first time, when I, was traveling, I was passing by and I discovered this grain sorghum, the Jawari Bolten, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. the falling the, the the light of the dust was falling on it and it was looking like a like a jewel, like a diamond, and it actually oh, struck goodness. me that what, what am I doing? And uh, and I started to ask questions to my younger generation. And especially the kids and my own uh, 12 year old kid did not know from where potato came, from where carrot came until they watched Peppa Pig. And it's, it's really <laughs> sad for people. It's really sad for people not to know because when I was a kid, my grandfather took me to a field 
and he said, you know, pluck out these green leaves. And suddenly, uh, from those green leaves and from the beautiful brown earth came out orange carrots. And then I washed them in the flowing canal and just had them uh, raw. And that was the most beautiful feeling I had as a kid. And that that's when I started, uh, my, my interest in food started growing. And that's when right. my paternal and my maternal grandfathers and my grandmother started teaching me about food, importance of food, and the, the variousness in food, which is so important uh, for us. And probably it will be, be really nice if somehow we can pass all this through to our coming generations. Not only the importance, but from where it comes. Uh, yeah. What is soy? Why is it so important? We can actually teach them. This book actually takes a leap forward in teaching them all that. But yes, mm -hmm. uh, individually, if we read these books, or these kind of books, and tell people why these are important, not only for us, but for us, we will not be able to pass this book. If we don't pass this book, we will extinct slowly. And that's, mm -hmm. that's exactly what we don't want. And they are on verge of extinction. We say Cheetah is on verge of extinction. These brains are also on verge of the same thing. And we need to realize this. And we will not finish this book. Our ignorance will finish this book. Which is Absolutely. very important. We are not hunting the, the cheetah like the grain. We are ignoring it because we want maida. Because we want. Maida. And, and, and you know the irony is this is this is a comment to all of you. The irony is that we are looking for variety in food, but ultimately it's only the same basic grains we are having. We are having too much of wheat, which leads to all kinds of gluten issues. We are having too much of rice, and that's about it. Uh, yes. We are not really exploring the other grains which are available, not only in the Himalayan foothills, but all across um, uh, the Indian subcontinent, uh, we don't have that variety. Nobody eats bajre ki roti and jawar ki roti or um, other preparations which our ancestors would have done. Um, a wheat roti would have been probably once a week. What do you say, Dr. Yeah. Pan? I would go as far as to say it was once a week. I would say there are wheat growing reasons, corn growing reasons, ragi growing reasons, rice yeah. growing reasons, where you have a roti made of rice. Where you have, so let's not simplify it to that extent. But I think there was a time and a place and a seasonality which Veena Ji has mentioned. There is a desh and a kaal, and there is a ritu and a season, and you okay. ate accordingly. And you right. ate variety. You did not have, I mean, you had veg seasonal vegetables, you had beefy bean vegetables, you had lentils, legumes, you had tubers. So you combined your food. Meena Ji, there's this very interesting question that has come in all the way from Australia. Vikram writes in to ask you a fascinating topic and discussion. Would you comment on the possible relationship between regionally sourced foods and resilience to infection? Well, I suppose when you talk of in resilience to infection, we are making a reference to COVID, I think. And I think one of the things that we need to remember is the toxicity that we are introducing into our environment through the kind of foods that we eat, the packages, etc. If you remember uh, Bushpesh ji and also um, Gautam ji, that uh, there was a time when, uh, when all festivals, foods used to be prepared at home. And right. before that, the, a few days before that, there was a sort of a environment of festivity in the house because of the yeah. fragrances, etc. And yeah. then it would be placed in a platter from the house, from the home, and sent to the neighbor or to friends. So a little bit mm -hmm. of ourselves went into it. But today, yeah. what we get is a glittering package with a lot of tinsel and a little bit of commercially produced something in it, like what yeah. you said, with meda and God knows what all. And then this tinsel goes into our mountains and rivers and it releases toxicity. We speak yeah. of pollution and we only think of air pollution. But what about all this pollution that we have put into the system, into yeah. our ecosystem? We have to remember that this is a singular ecosystem and everything is related to, the, uh, to another. There's nothing which is not related to another. So if we are insensitive to one thing, we are bound to get the uh, the after effects of that, and that's what's happening. So the regional foods or whatever, where whichever region we are we are located in, it's yeah. very important that we eat seasonally, regionally, locally, and if we do that, 
surely we are going to keep infections away and we will keep a lot of toxicity away from our environment. Uh, well, you know, from our environment, from our attitudes as well. Sorry? I said, um, uh, you know, the moment you're positive in what you eat, when you eat holistically, you become more positive uh, towards whatever is happening it, around it, us. It, as I, traditionally, it is said, ahar shuddha, sattva shuddhi, that right. when we eat holistically, then right. our potential is more uh, manifested. It is, so, 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 so whichever, whichever part of the string of, of, of this great hole that you pick from, whichever point you start from, if you start from reverence from that point, um, the entire thing comes a full circle and becomes um, an experience um, of, of spirituality. Okay, fine, we, we, we agree with uh, uh, Dr. Pan, you keep religion out of it, keep the dev out of the and well, make no, him no, no, be. Sp spirituality is not spirituality religion. Spirituality has nothing to do with religion. I would That's what I said. Happy. That's yeah. what I said. Keep religion out. Let's keep the spirituality and reverence in. And that probably is the way out, isn't it? Indeed. Um, sensitivity. To be sensitive right. to ourselves, to our environment, to our uh, those around us, to our soils and waters, everything. Yeah. Oh, um, Dr. Pan, we're coming towards uh, you know the last, last few minutes of this uh, webinar. What is your one big takeaway from this? My one big takeaway from this book is that it's a very, very significant contribution towards mm -hmm. raising awareness and making us more mindful about what we eat, making right. us a little more compassionate and think mm -hmm. in terms of living in harmony with reason, season and harmony with nature and fellow beings. I think the, this takeaway is good enough for me to last a lifetime. Absolutely. Very poetically put. And I think uh, I think we all agree with you. Gautam, what, what, what do you think you have, you know, the one thing you're going to hold close from this book? I think the best thing about this book or the best thing around this book is that, you know, uh, somebody got a gift from nature. In fact, somebody got a pardon gift from nature. And then that somebody is sharing that gift with you, penning it down, uh, photographing it down and processing it out. So receive that gift and then pass on this gift. I think that's the biggest mm -hmm. takeaway I would have from it. Uh, exactly. The, 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 the giving lies in the receiving, and that is how the circle uh, carries on. And as you said, this is a legacy, a heritage that we have to give uh, to pass forward. You know, like you, you pass forward a good deed. Exactly that's like that, true. isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Somebody got gifts from, his, from her childhood till the day. Right. Uh, the book was written and all those gifts have been written down in that in that book receive those gifts and just pass it on and and you'll make the world a better place absolutely that's very well put thanks so much gautam uh, veera ji last last uh, word to you well i I've, I've said it before and i say it again that all of nature is satiated when we eat well and i also wish to say that in view of the apathy and in the absence of any monitoring or regulatory system for all the haphazard construction that is taking place instead of those farms, right. let us individually take it upon ourselves and say that we will use these local foods. And in, as individuals, when we become a collective, we may be able to save some farms and the culture that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And I would say, please buy from the local vendor that will right. bring down immensely the quantum of garbage that we produce. That is what I would like to say. I, I, I think I agree with you completely. Actually, all three of you, um, you know, you live in harmony with nature. Um, you, you give what you receive and that circle continues and sensitivity. I think that kind of uh, sums up what this book is all about and uh, what we all need to be all about, isn't it? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pan, Dr. Mehrishi, Vina Sharmaji. It's been wonderful to talk to you. And of course, thank you to IIC and the Food Foundation for this. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and namaste. All the technical support. Yes, of course. Thank you to the technical support as well. Yes.